Okay. Good day and um, to all of you because you are all joining from different parts of the world. We thank you for joining today for this webinar. We are excited to hear all things that we can learn from Nick uh, Saxby. He is going to tell us how we can market through storytelling. So I'm really personally excited because we can learn a lot from you, Nick. So um, before that, we just want to give like a small uh, brief introduction to Coco Town. So bear with me for a few minutes. I won't make it too long. And then uh, we can go to the webinar. So can you all see my screen? Uh, so Coco Town. Yeah, we have the Coco Town. The parent company is called Inno Concepts and we started in 1992. So we started trading innovative specialty food processing machines. And we focus primarily on the small segment that's the South Asians, you know, South Indian, not even South Asia. The Indians and out of that, there's the South Indians that we use, make special kind of food called idli and dosa. So those machines, uh, we were just trading and um, selling all over the years. And we also had a lot of just, uh, you know, dealers in different parts of the country. So people can take it for service and other uh, help locally instead of shipping it them to Atlanta because those days their shipping was very expensive still it's expensive but when compared to the cost of the machine the shipping was almost like 25 uh, percent and then um, whenever somebody um, you know uh, buys the machine if we don't recognize the South Indian name we used to call them and ask them hey we see that you have bought our machine what do you use it for and we were collecting the data and then you know the recession hit in the later part of 2007 2008 2009 were the worst days and then we had warehouse full of stuff and we didn't have any sale in 2008 christmas so we wanted to find a new avenue because we need to keep the company going we need to pay our employees so um, we, we looked at the list of things that we had collected and we found out some people were making for nut butter, some people were making for, uh, you know, um, tahini, hummus, the uh, Filipino puto, a lot of things they were making. And even one customer in New York, she was getting the sphagnum moss from the park, Central Park, and then she was grinding for the facial mask. And she said, her you know clients loved it and it was much cheaper than importing the face mask from europe so there were so many different ideas we were thinking where should we focus because we realized by just focusing on the south indian market we are putting all our you know eggs in one basket that's not good we had to spread it out so then we looked at and then we found some people were making for chocolate in those days only like five companies were making uh, chocolate in small scale. Even those five companies, it's called small scale because when compared to the giants like Mars and Hershey's and Lynn, these were smaller companies. But then there were few people, they were trying to bring the cocoa beans as a superfood. So they were trying to make uh, chocolate without any additives or uh, things that you cannot pronounce, but they were doing in small batches as a hobby because they had to be MacGyver's. So when we talked to them, we asked them what is their challenge and they said the challenge is this machine runs for 20 minute batches, whereas we have to change it to a, the machine that runs nonstop for at least three days a week to you know, finish one batch. That's when we thought maybe this is a new avenue, nobody has done it, so let's get into that. So we started uh, focusing on creating the machine specifically for the chocolate industry and always our focus was make sure we leave the you know uh, less impact on the environment so we leave the environment better than what we found and then help our customers businesses to grow and then help the farmers and then so we came up with the coco town name in 2009 and then um, that has helped us uh, you know to help the farmers because the people who make chocolate with our machines they most of the time they're buying directly from the farmers and they are paying more than the, the commodity price and they are also helping the farmers in other ways. So this is just a small timeline from, you know, in 1992 we formed the company, but in 94 we started selling the products because we took two years 
to figure out what to sell. And then in uh, you know 2007, uh, we started selling these machines, and you know we have the patents on our machines, so it's like a one of a kind machines. A lot of people are now copying, but we came up with them first. And then in 2020, again we had to um, you know focus on what we have to do when the pandemic hit the whole world. So that's when we thought you know uh, everybody um, is stuck like in most of the places like philippines they were in lockdown for almost you know two years so we had to give them some hope and we also thought we can help them to learn when the, there's a downtime for to learn and there were a lot of uh, experts like nick and other people they were gracious enough to donate their time so we brought this empowering chocolate news webinar and uh, you know in september we are completing two years so thank you all of you because without your support we could not have been uh, done for two years so we thank you also we thank nick and then so we want to return to the normal life and meet people in um you know face to face so the travel has started but still you know there are a lot of uh, you know roadblocks because the airline fees are much more expensive now and then it's you know so we are still thinking to bring the bin to bar workshop in person workshop sometime hopefully next year so we always uh, want to continue the virtual connections because from one place we can reach all over the world and we just want to start with the loka samasta sukhino bhavantu that all just uh, translates into may all beings everywhere in the universe be happy and free and may the thoughts words and actions of my own life contribute in some way to that happiness and to that freedom for all thank you now i will hand over the mic to teresa thank you mrs balu okay so i'm uh, charged with a little bit of housekeeping so what i would like to let you know uh, if it's your first time and just a reminder if you've been with us before welcome back uh, you uh, we will be recording this session, so you'll get a link to view the recording later. So don't worry about uh, having to take notes, or if you miss something, you will get a recording to view the presentation at a later time. Uh, if you have a question as it comes up during the presentation, feel free to put it in the chat. And then when we get to the end, we will um, have a Q&A session where we'll get to talk to Nick and ask our questions. Um, I think that covers everything uh, regarding housekeeping on my end. So what I would like to do is just do a little quick Q&A with Nick uh, so we can get to know him better. Um, so what I would like to ask you, Nick, is can you tell us where um, your chocolate journey started or something about where uh, your love of chocolate began or how, how did you end up on this path that you're on? Sure. No, I... I... Thanks for having me, obviously. And yeah, I, I like Mrs. Ballow's sentiment to end on then. It's really, uh, really nice as well. But um, uh, yeah, so um, I don't really have a grand romantic journey. Like I wish I could say that I would, you know, chocolate was a massive part of my life and as a child, and I remember baking cakes with my grandparents. I don't have any of that, I'm afraid. Um, I did, um, my background is wildlife and ecology and wildlife conservation, and I was a teacher. And I, I, as I'll explain a little bit of that in, when I get talking, but um. I was studying a master's degree a couple of years ago, and I did my dissertation on how you can use cocoa agroforestry uh, as a conservation tool to help protect forests. And out of that emerged kind of, uh, it was sort of academically interesting, but then I just kind of realized, well, actually, not only can you produce chocolate in a way that's really good for the environment, it tastes amazing. And there's this whole amazing world of artisans and, and enthusiasts, and there's a world of flavor to explore and all, and it just sort of unfolded relatively quickly really um and i've gone all in since then on, and so that's been yeah about about three years now uh, i've been on this journey thank you thank you for that so yeah you said not a very i think we talked before not a romantic story but that is a yeah. that is a wonderfully romantic story it was out of your love for con conservation and um you know that that you found that in chocolate is I find yeah, that so as well. And I look at it that it's like the your reward for, for doing good with chocolate is that it, you get a really great tasting thing. Um, I think what I'm going to unfortunately have to reveal is that probably it's the other way around, that there's this great tasting thing and that the, the bonus of it is that it's really, uh, that it has a positive impact. But 
it's just philosophical, I suppose. Great. Okay, Nick. Well, I'm going to um, turn the presentation, turn the the floor over to you, and I look forward to the presentation. Oh, Thank you again for for joining us. No, honestly, my pleasure. As as I'm hoping to explain over the next few minutes, that I I, I really enjoy talking about chocolate. So uh, so it's uh, honestly my pleasure. Um. So what I need to do is share my screen with you all. Um, once that's presenting properly. Now, hopefully, unless anyone tells me otherwise, you, you should all now be able to see my screen. And what I will do, I'll keep the like the other little tabs and buttons and things open just so I can keep an eye on that. And then I'll be able to talk to you there. So, yeah, thank you so much for, for letting me talk to you. Um, my name is Nick Saxby um, and I work with Cocoa Runners in the, where I'm here in the UK. I live in Scotland uh, on the east coast of Scotland. Uh, and it's amazing to see just quite how diverse the audience is today, people from all over the place. But I didn't see Scotland being mentioned, so I think I'm uh, representing Scotland uh, in isolation here, but that's fine. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to talk today, uh, share my experiences um, and different things that I've done in my life that have helped me um, essentially understand how to best communicate about chocolate specifically and use some of the lessons that I've learned um, along the way. Um, so and we're going to do a, a slightly interactive uh, presentation as well today. Um, and what I mean by that is we're going to use a platform called Menti. Now, what I'd like you to do, if you're able, um, it would be great if you've got a second device, like a phone or a tablet, or you've got another screen, or even if you're really pro at swapping between this presentation and, a, and another tab in your browser, whatever you've got, if you could go to menti.com, which is at the top of the screen at menti.com, and then enter the code that you see there. Alternatively, if you're feeling very high tech, you can scan the QR code that's on the screen there, um, and that should take you directly to where you need to be. Um, once you're on, uh, you can tick the little thumbs up thing just to show that uh, people are, uh, are arriving on the yeah, I can see people showing up now, that's fantastic. Um, uh, if you can't, for whatever reason, do that, if you don't have the tech available, or you, even if you're just not comfortable, that's absolutely fine. Um, you can interact with the presentation today by just dropping things into the chat. Um, and myself and Teresa and, and Svala will keep an eye on that as we go along. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions as we go. So feel free to interrupt me. Uh, it's absolutely no problem. But if you are able to use Yen Menti, I would encourage you to do that because it's going to let you respond to questions I'm going to ask you share your thoughts and, and feelings as we go and stuff like that. Um, cool, so I can see a few of you on there. That's absolutely fantastic. I've put the uh, meant, I've put the little instructions at the top of the screen there on all the slides where I'm gonna ask you to interact. So if it, you know, when we get to one of those points, if you, for whatever reason, you've lost the QR code or something, uh, it's not a problem, you'd be able to jump straight back in. And you should be able to see the slides on your second device as well, if you've got that to hand. Right, so let's uh, get stuck in. So the first, Thing, point to make is why are we doing this uh, presentation? Um, and uh, I, I kind of have been learning over the past few years that unfortunately, being a really effective communicator isn't necessarily a part of all of the toolkits for chocolate makers. Um, and that's, that's fine, obviously. That's, you know, it, there are amazing chocolate makers doing amazing work, and their focus is on the skills and talents that allow them to produce supreme chocolate, you know, with, you know, Whatever you're doing with chocolate, whether you're making bean to bar or whether you're creating amazing patisserie or whatever it is, you know, you don't necessarily have to have communication as a skill set. So I think I've chosen uh, Mr. Willy Wonka there, obviously, because I would argue he's a good example of someone who's not a great communicator. I mean, terrifying children and being confusing and cryptic, uh, slightly menacing, uh, I don't think is a good, a good vibe for a, a, a chocolate uh, producer, right? Um, but I like to think of craft chocolate in particular as being as much of a movement as a sort of industry sector. And whichever you know, aspect of it you're involved in, if you're a bean trader or a chocolate maker or a cocoa farmer or someone like me, I work in retail, Cocoa Runners is among other things a retailer. Um, you know, we're all working towards this common goal of, of improving the quality of cocoa and chocolate, uh, raising its profile for consumers and ultimately having a really positive effect on the environments and the people and places where, where cocoa comes from, right? Um, and the phrase that I think sums that up is a high tide raises all boats. Um, because, you know, some of, you know, there might be some of you here today who are direct competitors with each other, technically, right? If you're both chocolate makers, 
and you might be selling your chocolate to the same markets um, and that makes you competitors. But at the same time, we're also all on the same team. And if we grow the movement together and share the different skills we have, then I think that could be really positive. And so there's people who uh, in organizations like Coca Runners where we can act as a platform to help you know, raise this profile and advocate for good chocolate. Um, and we can share those skills amongst each other. That's the way I'm thinking about it. And I'd like to thank the reason that I'm here in the first place is because I did a, a version of this talk at Chicoa this year. Um, uh, and I did that with Christina of previously of uh, Into Choco fame. Uh, some of you might have come across Into Choco and Christina and Vera's work doing um, uh, really great stuff on transparency and traceability. Um, so it's worth highlighting that, you know, she's partly responsible for, for uh, creating these concepts that we're talking about today. Um, so I want to know a bit more about some of you just to frame what we're talking about here. So hopefully on your second device or wherever, whatever you're interacting with, um, you can see the question there, who are you and what's your role in chocolate? So you don't necessarily have to give me your name or anything like that, but if you could let me know like where you are in the chocolate world, are you a maker? Are you a farmer? Are you a retailer? Are you a wholesale person? Are you a trader? What, whatever you are, just so I can get a sense of who I'm talking to here. I think a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about today is predominantly aimed at makers, I, I think, or people who are producing uh, endpoint uh, products that, that are facing consumers. Um, so let's see, chocolate experience provider educator. Ah, you lead tasting, so cool. So you'll have a sense of some of the stuff that I'm talking about already. Um, uh, we've got a couple of people working for Coco Town. Uh, we've got a chocolate maker, a trader, and there's cacao ceremonies. Oh, well, I, can't, I have, to do, have to earn my pay for the day and say, well, uh, Coco Runners is doing a special cacao ceremony session tomorrow, 2 p.m. UK time. If you want to tune in and watch Spencer from Coco Runners with Pablo from Forever Cacao talk about and deconstruct cacao ceremonies, uh, then uh, do come along for that. Uh, interested in getting into retail and making beans to bar chocolate, a tree to bar maker. I'm really keen to learn more about tree to bar makers. I think that's a really cool thing. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've got some people making... Uh, planning to rehab some cocoa trees. Awesome, awesome. All right, so we've actually got a bit of a uh, uh, a diversity of different people here, but that's really fantastic. But I guess a lot of what I'm talking about is how to connect whatever you're doing to consumers, to people out there in the real world who aren't chocolate nerds like all of us, um, who want to learn more about chocolate, engage with the world of chocolate. Um, uh, and we've got a chocolatier there. Um, Cool. So, as I say, a nice diversity. That's really cool. Um, who am I? Well, I'm, as I, you know, as I said when I was chatting with Teresa, in my background is wildlife and ecology, um, and that's taken lots of different forms over, over my, uh, my past. That's a picture of me tracking buffalo in South Africa there, where I was a, um, a field guide and a lodge manager, where I used to take people on educational safari experiences and also entertain guests at a luxury lodge. And so, I've gained some experience in how to talk to people, how to sneak education into an entertainment experience, which is a lot of what I do when I do virtual tasting experiences with Coca Runners. Um, so I've done that. I've done uh, teaching uh, as well. So I was an animal sciences lecturer uh, before I came to do um, uh, craft chocolate related work and get into the chocolate space. Um, and I've also, in the midst of that, I've done a bit of campaigning as well. So I've done some local politics campaigning. Um, and I worked with a group of people who, unfortunately, we didn't quite get there. We almost unseated our local council in the UK um, and we made lots of great progress. But uh, the, for reasons that are probably too complicated to go into here, the voting system is not great in the UK in general. Um, but yeah, so I've got some experience about how to talk to people about issues that matter and how to get messages that resonate with people and, and frame conversations in a certain way. And now what I am is content, I do content and communications for Coca Runners. So if you're not aware of who Coca Runners are, we are a, a craft chocolate uh, retailer, uh, a subscription service and uh, advocacy platform, I guess. We do virtual tasting sessions every single week where we, uh, and they're free to attend, where we present a range of different craft chocolates to people, introduce the concept of craft chocolate, and sort of embed some of the history and geography and science behind the kind of most interesting points about chocolate uh, and deliver kind of some bits and pieces about the impact and the kind of responsible consumption of chocolate as well. So that's kind of the framing of, of where I'm coming at uh, with all of this. 
Um, but I'll start with coca runners because that's that's essentially why I'm here today. And I think uh, coca runners is in a unique position in that we have just delivered so many tasting sessions um, that we have got, I, I think perhaps arguably, some of the best uh, direct consumer market research in the craft chocolate space. Um, and I wish we had formalized it more. I'd love to be able to show you loads of graphs and charts and things like that. A lot of it is, is quite anecdotal, but we've delivered virtual tasting sessions to more than 15,000 participants. I think we could potentially have delivered uh, craft chocolate tasting to maybe as many as 25,000 people uh, just in the last two or three years. Um, so we've had a lot of contact. We've gained a lot of experience with how to talk to people about chocolate. Um, and these are quite often, for lack of a better term, they're normal people, right? They're not the kind of all chocolate nerds and chocolate enthusiasts like we all are. Um, they might be people who've been gifted a thing by someone who just Googled chocolate tasting and they've ended up on the Coconuts website and they've sent a box to a friend or family member. They might have come to, through private booking. They work for some big corporation and they've been given a, a social experience where they all, you know, a whole team go online and they attend a chocolate tasting, which Coconuts delivers. And so a lot of people who've sort of accidentally cross-sected um, the chocolate world, the craft chocolate space. And so we've got some great insight on, on normal people. Um, so we've learned a lot about what they care about, what they respond to, uh, what messages connect with them, and how to talk to them, what formats are really helpful um, and useful as well. Um, so another question for you, though, what do you think most chocolate consumers care most about? So what do you think is the kind of primary issue or motivator or topic that brings people into chocolate that gets them thinking about chocolate and that they care about that they respond to um, and let's see where we think about this so i've asked this question through social media a few different times i've asked this informally and i've kind of gauged people's responses in general as well we've done a bit of polling of our mailing lists at coca runners as well so fair trade is up there so obviously we talk a lot about fair trade or, or and, and fair trading in, in general. So uh, we've got some nice, very niche thing, texture, interesting about texture, bean to bar. So that's a good key phrases. Price is in there as a primary primary thing. Price is a really challenging thing to talk about. And I'll, I'll come to that right at the end. Um, uh, sustainability is in there. So for me, um, like sustainability, uh, environmental impact, that sort of thing, that's what drives me. That's why I feel this is all worth doing. Um, um, my reward is the is the to treat oneself as someone has put there. And um, we've got a lot of concern about taste, ingredients, organic comfort and familiarity. So you see how we've got a very broad idea. Um, I mean, they're saying quality in the chat as well. We've got a pretty broad spectrum of things that people can be interested in. Um, and some of these you could group together into different sort of subsets. Um, but what we found broadly is that there's there's three main categories that, that, that people are driven by, really. Um, and it is uh, nutrition and health. So the kind of physical effect that chocolate has on you as a food item when you, uh, when you consume it, which overlaps a little bit with organic. I know organic can also be sort of an impact related thing. Um, what else have we got? Anything that would fit in that? Comfort and familiarity, perhaps. There's lots of conversations about well-being and treating yourself and that sort of stuff. Anyway, but health and impact on your own body, and nutrition and that sort of stuff. Then there is the bucket of people who are interested in the impact and being responsible and sustainable with their consumption. So things like worrying about whether cocoa has been ethically sourced, uh, and that can be whether that's an impact on the environment or on the people that have produced the cocoa. Fair trade is a kind of, a, I know we use that term very broadly, but captures some of these issues. Organic as well is in there. Um, when people talk about bean to bar, they're quite often lumping those terms in with this as well. Um, and then there's another subset of people. The third group is um, someone said, yeah, so I'm pick on Amelia saying quality and talking about quality of experience, flavor, uh, enjoyment, the fineness of the experience and the quality of the food. And they seem to be the three main buckets you can put people into. Now, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately for me, because it's not what I would like it to be, but we have overwhelmingly discovered that people's general primary focus is flavor. So that personal thing about the flavor experience, the quality of it, 
that's the thing that motivates consumers most about um, about fine chocolate, craft chocolate, quality chocolate, premium chocolate, whatever you want to call it. They're primarily focused on the amazing experience that they can have when they consume it. And so the lesson that I can share with you as a, you know, from someone who's done a lot of this outreach with consumers to people like you who are producing chocolate, producing cocoa products is you've got to lead with that first. You've got to find every opportunity to get people tasting your products, get people tasting that chocolate and, and realizing that actually there's an amazing experience to be had that. And off the back of that, the result is um, that people can you know, feel like, oh, actually, you know, I'm, I'm paying loads of money for this fine experience. And the byproduct is that it's actually doing good as well. You know, it's good for the environment, it's good for people. Uh, Denise is saying, which market did you do your research, UK? I mean, I would put a big asterisk next to the word research. Um, I don't want to formalize it too much. Like where this is, the, a lot of this is anecdotal. Um, and I'm just speaking from our experiences, but um, predominantly the UK, um, but uh, I would say Western and Northern Europe it makes up maybe uh, a third or so of our audiences, um, and then maybe a quarter or so from North America in particular. Um, and it's not very representative of the rest of the world, markets in the rest of the world, if we're entirely honest. Um, but obviously that's a good question to ask because that does frame, like this is biased to some extent. And because given how diverse the audience is here today, some of this might not necessarily 100% impact on your markets. Um, but yeah, but I, 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 I'm fairly confident this is a pretty broad, broad thing and it's probably fairly applicable across most people um, who are eating chocolate in the kind of in the dominant chocolate markets in the, in the Western world. So yeah, so the, my advice is you've got to find that opportunity to get people tasting. So whether that is you go out of your way to find opportunities, to find a pop-up shop somewhere where you can appear to get yourself uh, you know, guesting at a coffee shop or a cafe or a bar or something. Um, attend events wherever you can. Get to a farmer's market. Um, get on a podcast and get some arrangement where you can send samples out to a certain number of people that you can then talk about. Wherever there's an opportunity to get people to taste first, you have to seize that opportunity. Um, because people, once you've got that flavor in their mouth, once they've got that visceral sensorial experience, everything else can flow from that. Um, another lesson we've learned is that uh, it's quite surprising how little people, how little people know and perhaps how little people care about uh, really technical things. Um, so a lot of people come to our chocolate tastings with uh, no concept that there is any sort of spectrum of quality for chocolate. They've, they've been eating Mars bars and Kit Kats and Cadbury's Dairy Milks their whole life. Um, and they've maybe now started eating Tony's because uh, or whatever finer, slightly posher chocolate brands are appearing in, in, in supermarkets. And uh, they don't really sense that there is this other world of chocolate, that there's fine chocolate, that there's alternative chocolate, that there's um, any of these sorts of things. They haven't really thought about what bean to bar really means. Um, and so the lesson perhaps is that we don't need to give them lots of technical information. So I've, I've attended tastings in my sort of secret surveillance of the world of chocolate tastings. Um, I've attended tastings where people have, have been lecturing uh, attendees about how, how the fermentation works and how um, the roasting profiles affect the chemistry that produces the flavor and things like that. Um, and people, people just aren't interested, I'm afraid. Um, you kind of, for the most part, most people are entering with a kind of vague interest in exploring something a bit fine and a bit premium um, and everything else will flow from that as I've said so don't give people lectures um, don't bombard them with technical information let them come to you and ask um, and if people aren't asking the questions then it might mean that they're not, they're not concerned but as I said before if you get them having that sensory experience the rest will come in the end um, and a big thing that a lot of people miss in chocolates, in the chocolate world, is that chocolate should be fun. Chocolate is a fun, enjoyable, potentially sensual, for some people, spiritual experience. It should be fun and engaging. Um, and when people come to a chocolate tasting, they're looking for entertainment predominantly, right? Uh, the trick is how once you've got them in an entertaining environment, you can deliver information and education and, and give them important messages. 
Um, but for the most part, no one wants to have a fun time at a chocolate tasting that is all being lectured about the social environmental impact, you know, and these and all these sorts of things. They're, they're massive issues. They're the issues that keep me awake at night, but we can't be opening with those things. It needs to be fun first. And then once people are on board, once people are having a good time, once you're cracking jokes, you can, you know, start to filter at them. You know, actually, there's some there's some there's some there's a dark side of chocolate that we do need to talk about. Let's talk about it for a little bit, but let's get back to tasting chocolate. Um, and you can kind of drip feed those messages out there. Um, I think a big problem that a lot of in, environmental campaigning has in general is it opens with a kind of prophecies of doom and it's very uh, authoritarian and telling people off and saying that you're destroying the planet because you're doing this, that and the other. And, and unfortunately, a lot of that just is not is not well received by people. And there's lots of research, nothing to do with chocolate, but there's lots of research on how campaigning works that positive messages are always much more effective, making a positive case for why change can produce uh, a better outcome is much better than telling people that if you keep doing what you're already doing, it leads to a negative outcome. So focus on that, Folk make things fun and entertaining and all the positivity that that generates uh, will, will go a long way towards helping you. Um, so those are some messages that uh, that I hope kind of resonate with you based on what we've experienced at Cocoa Runners. Um, but what's the main way already that you interact with your customers? So to kind of think, how can we how can we find opportunities with how we interact with our customers now that are much more positive? So through virtual sessions. So I mean that that's the, the main way that I do it, um, and it's almost as good as as doing things in person, to be honest. Um, there are lots of things, lots of problems that people have. And again, by I've done some like, uh, I guess you'd call it competitor research, right? But I've done so, lots of um, surveillance of the world of chocolate tastings. And there's, um, there's a lot of kind of common problems that people have. People seem very fond of doing a virtual tasting session and then playing a video in the middle of it and sort of outsourcing what you're doing. Um, I strongly advise against that. Um, that you're you're dis, you're creating even more distance between you and the person attending um so yeah so if you're one of those four people that are saying something else do drop it in the chat and let's see what we're doing uh barterfest family gatherings host gifting gatherings with friends so that's really interesting so like lots of informal situations so that i i would argue or i perhaps would guess is is a good place where this sort of entertainment and fun emerges right and once you've got people around having a good time you can then talk about more serious things. Um, at mar events and markets, there are, there's probably no more effective way to get people on board with chocolate other than you literally stand in front of them and you hand them a, a little paper cup with a piece of chocolate in it and say, taste that. And then while they're tasting it, you talk to them and then you get them to taste a different cocoa origin or a different product you've made from the same cocoa or whatever it is that you're doing. It's invaluable thing to be able to do. Um, but it's very narrow, right? So you can go very deep, but you don't get the kind of breadth of being able to reach lots of different people. Um, so social media um, is a challenging one as well. So social media, you can reach you know, millions, billions of people, um, but you're held back by, it's not a sensory experience and, and you don't get real time interaction, unless perhaps you're doing you know, live, Facebook live or whatever, YouTube live, something like that. Um, so we haven't got people in a shop, that's interesting. Um, uh, perhaps because you know it's much harder to run a shop and it's going to get much harder to run a kind of bricks and mortar retail place in the near future right um, at least in some parts of the world um but yeah i thought perhaps that we would have more people who are actually in, in a shop but yeah again this kind of diversity of, of different ways that we can reach people to try and reflect on what's what opportunities do you have to get chocolate to people and to make it fun when they consume it and if you can find those opportunities um I think you would be really surprised about how quickly you can kind of grow your connections with people. Um, so I'd like to share a little bit about uh, my experience in teaching as well. Um, policy, if I'm rattling through this, please do you can tell me to, to slow down or be quiet or, uh, or you can ask me questions in the chat if you want. Um, but I was a teacher for many years, I was an award-winning teacher, um, and I've developed lots of skills on how to deliver classroom experiences and uh, it doesn't entirely overlap, but I think there are lots of important lessons that you can learn from how to craft an educational experience 
Um, and I think that applies really well when it comes to tastings. Because when we're talking about fine or premium or craft chocolate, part of what we're trying to do is educate our consumers into existence. The craft market is what, 0.1% of the, the chocolate sector or something. So there's a lot of work to be done to grow awareness of it. Um, and if we can use certain educational tools and teaching tools, I think we can we can deliver interactions with people in a really meaningful way. Um, anyway, so I think about learning styles and I think about how different people learn in different ways. So if you think about, about how you best learn, are you the sort of person who likes to read and absorb and then reflect on the written words and take it in that way? Perhaps you're a person that likes really visual things. Perhaps you're a person that likes to see charts, color coded and, and whatever those sorts of, I'm one of those people. I've got every, all the colors of the rainbow on every spreadsheet that I ever produced because I, that, that, my mind is organized by colors. Um, and some people like to hear things. Some people really engage with podcasts and audio and, and that sort of thing. Um, and some people might be more tactile. So a lot of people will say that they learn best by doing um, and getting their hands on a task and they learn by doing that. Uh, the sort of people who open up a, a piece of furniture, a box of furniture or whatever, and they immediately throw the instructions away because they need to just do it and figure it out. And learn. Anyway, so different people learn in different ways. So you can't have a one size fits all thing uh, for how to get people engaged with chocolate. Um, it can't be you just present some uh, visual imagery to them. Um, uh, you can't just give them a recording of your voice telling them about the flavor. You can't just rely on the flavor notes you've written on the back of your packaging uh, to deliver everything that you need. Um, so be mindful that, you know, maybe even in one interaction, you're getting, uh, you might have to tailor your message to be delivered in lots of different formats. Um, I like to think about learning outcomes. So I like to think whenever I'm engaging with a chocolate consumer, I think, what do I want them to learn? What do I want to achieve with this interaction? What's the piece of information that I'd like them to take away? What's the behavior that I would like to change in them? Um, and if you start with that and you start thinking about what's their beginning points, what are they, where, where are they starting from? Where are they coming from? And focus on that rather than having your top down, you've got your idea of how it should be and how people should consume chocolate, how people should do things a certain way. Um, if you come at it from that direction, uh, it's not gonna be as positive an experience. It's not gonna be an effective experience. Um, a good example of this um, is people being very prescriptive about how to do tastings. Um, so obviously there's a certain best practice on how to do things. Uh, but for me personally, I, I'm not a big fan, I know this may be controversial. I'm not a big fan of the listening to a snap in a bar of chocolate. Um, I don't know, what, I don't quite get what the value of it is necessarily. I mean, I, I understand the principle of it and I understand why people do it, but it doesn't have any real impact for me. So I, if I'm doing a tasting, I might be less inclined to, to, to be engaged with if someone's snapping a thing. You know, but it, the point is that there's different variations on how people engage with stuff. Um, uh, a good example of like good practice is um, Hazel Lee. If anyone's seen some of the work she's done with colors and using color to represent flavor, I think that's a good example of how you can use um, a different way to, to understand how people think to get people engaged with flavor. Um, <clears throat> now, just as an example of how you might approach something, I've kind of drafted a kind of very basic lesson plan. So if you're at all a, a, a teaching enthusiast, you'll know all about lesson planning, and all good teachers do a lesson plan for every single lesson, I'm sure. Um, Hazel, Hazel Lee uh, is her name. I'll put it in the chat for you. Um, uh, so, yeah, so she does uh, what is it? Taste with Colour, I think is what it's called. Um, uh, and she does some it's really impressive work. Um, and I really look at that. She's a good example of how you can uh, change the dynamic of how you do tasting. Um, I mean, at Coca Runners, we do some of that as well. At Coca Runners, we, we've worked on what we call the flavor wave. So we stay away from flavor wheels, which I know is the kind of go to thing that in the food and drink world, everyone loves a flavor wheel with different segments representing different categories of flavor and stuff. Um, but I certainly don't think that that captures the complexity of chocolate's flavor and how chocolate is a flavor that emerges and has peaks and troughs and, you know, high notes and low points and some of it's mellow and some of it has great length and 
there's lots of different variations on, on how we experience chocolate and it's not an instantaneous thing. And I think a flavor wheel doesn't capture that. So at Coco Runners, we use a wave to sort of be a visual representation of the journey you go on when you're tasting chocolate. Um, but again, there's no one size fits all. You might find that consumers you talk to have a different way. The trick is to be open-minded and be aware that there isn't just a, a script you can read from that says, this is how everyone's gonna experience chocolate. Anyway, so my lesson plan here, you don't have to worry about the nitty gritty of the details. I've just unloaded my mind onto this uh, for a second here. But the if I wanted to say, well, I wanna, I'm gonna do a, a piece of a session with people and I want them to understand the differences between cacao origin flavors. Um, so I would approach it that that's my learning objective. And by the, end of, by the end of my session, by the end of that segment of the session, I want people to have gone through this uh, process. So I, I can create a bunch of learning activities that will create an environment where people can explore that topic, um, such as tasting the chocolate made from different cocoa origins. I quite like to use um, uh, eat sometimes bars produced from different origins by the same maker, or perhaps the same origin by different makers. Uh, that, that often works really well with consumers as a kind of tip that I found. Anyway, but for the purposes of this, I might have the same maker, two different bars from different origins. Um, we have to be looking at the labels looking at the differences, looking at the information you can get about where the cocoa comes from. We might look at different geographies. We might literally look at a map. We might compare the environments where they're growing. We might look at the cultures that are different. Maybe the cocoa farming practices are different in two different origins. Um, and we would taste the chocolate and talk about its flavor and talk about what our experiences are, compare and contrast with others, all these sorts of things. We've got a bunch of materials like the physical things that we would use to do that. So whether that is a presentation or whatever. Um, and then we have a check on learning. So we have to be confident at the end of our little piece of learning that we've got some sort of check. We, we can see what's gone in or not. Um, so I'd be happy if, if someone could tell me that these two chocolates taste different because this one tastes like A, B and C. This one tastes like D, E, F. Um, and just being able to say different flavors for two different chocolates for me, that's a win. They've understood that there are different flavors from different cocoa origins. Um, at the very least, if they can pick a favorite, if they can tell me I like this one better than this one, they've been able to differentiate the flavors enough that they can form an opinion on it. So be thinking in those terms, like what do you want people to learn and how are you gonna confirm that they've learned it? Um, just talking at people and delivering information, it's just really boring and people don't engage with it. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do to, to win people over. Um, and if you're, this is gonna, this is, it gets a bit teacher nerdy kind of, uh, kind of thing here, but if you are, if you've ever been through teacher training or you've become a qualified teacher or you've done any sort of work on learning, uh, you'll have come across Bloom's taxonomy before, which is a very old school way of categorizing different levels of, un, of, of learning. Um, and the point that I'd like to make with this is that not everyone is gonna become a chocolate tasting expert after meeting you. And the best thing we can do is think, well, where are they starting from? And how will I know that they've achieved something really cool um, but in their time with me? So some people might come along and they can just about get that there's a difference between uh, a Mars bar and whatever product that you've, you've fed to them, right? And if they can identify that difference and they can remember, they can describe, oh, this chocolate is made this way, it's made bean to bar, and that's different than chocolate which is mass produced and full of additives or whatever, you know, and they've identified that's really quite simple. And there's a whole kind of hierarchy of different things. So some people might get quite, uh, might become quite critical. So at Coca Runners, we like people to come to our tasting sessions and ideally get quite high up this list by the end of it and find themselves being quite critical of chocolate and being really discerning and being uh, looking at labels and being aware of, the, of how uh, production techniques and process produce certain flavors. And maybe it means that they can then become a subscriber of ours that can continue exploring and pushing themselves to go higher up this thing. And I suppose the top tier in Bloom's taxonomy is you know, maybe the best expression of understanding cocoa and chocolate is to be able to create from it, right? So I think perhaps this, this bit doesn't quite fit so well with, uh, with what we're talking about um, because you don't have to be a chocolate maker to be an expert in chocolate, right? Um, but be aware that you know, people are gonna have different experiences. People are gonna 
leave their interactions with you with different levels of understanding. And that's fine, you know, and as long as you are aware of that and you're not expecting everyone to become an expert and being disappointed when they, they aren't taking the messages that you want them to take, um, then that's absolutely fine. Anyway, so uh, here's a kind of a slight aside to get a bit more philosophical about things. Why do you work in or with chocolate? So what is it that drives you? So we've talked a bit about what we think consumers are interested in, what motivates them and what motivates customers, but what keeps you going? What makes you want to get up in the morning and eat chocolate or make chocolate or make chocolate products or grow cocoa trees or, or, or rehabilitate a cocoa landscape or, or, or whatever, whatever it is that you're doing? What's kind of your motivator? So I'm hoping this is going to be quite diverse as well. So for me, it's seeing that creating a market for good chocolate creates an environment where uh, we can fund uh, sustainable land use in the tropics. So that's a bit niche, isn't it? But um, now why this is not loading up for some reason? Um, I have to, I'm going to have to click through them. So we'll go through them one by one. So it makes me happy. I like that. It's really sweet. Um, and that's really positive, right? So hold on to that thought. It makes you happy. Um, and you know, I think I would echo back to Mrs. Valu's uh, comments earlier about you know you can bring happiness into other people's lives as well. Your happiness affects other people, brings happiness into other people's lives. Um, my brother-in-law has land in Jamaica, and I have heirloom trees in his land. My goal is to bring quality Jamaican cocoa trees to chocolates around the world. So there's a thing about quality. There's a thing about celebrating a sense of place. There's something about Jamaicanness that you want to bring there, and you want to showcase so that's really positive uh, spread the word about craft chocolate flavors and methods of production spread the word so you're a communicator you're an educator think about what keywords you can use to attach to that this will make sense as we come to the next thing we help chocolate makers to make themselves and others happy so yeah spreading happiness is no bad thing right and I, again i'll echo back to that's kind of a big thing about what chocolate is about a lot of our memories and conceptions about what chocolate is are emotional they're connected to childhood um, you know, they're really visceral and primal because they're to do with taste and smell um, and happiness. If we can if we can make people happy when we're doing it, that's half the trick. Supporting families in Mexico and Peru to do their business best and thrive together. So, yeah, so something about um, impact, um, having a positive impact on other people uh, specifically. Connection to origin. So there's something geographic, something about. Is that connecting consumers to the origin or, or feeling you're connected to those origins? Um, oh, a symbiotic relation. That's a good word, symbiotic. So there's something about you creating chocolate or creating uh, whatever it is that you do that is good for you and it's bringing a thing to life at the same time. How many more of these we got? Intrigued by the bean to bar process, want to get good at something that's delicious, good for the body, helps support family. So you're focused in on that good for the body and uh, um, uh, and that's delicious there's something about that it's experiential you're intrigued there's an intellectual nature to it as well there's something academic something scholarly maybe even um, uh, I have a level of chocolate making here that is very specialized using chocolate mostly as a delivery system for other medicines interesting so that's so again health and 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 that side of things that's what's connecting to you if, if medicine is is in there um understanding what we're eating perhaps I'm, if i'm getting if i'm guessing something about nutrition health impact on the body um studying food science you take all courses related to industry and i fell in love with chocolate and the process I decided to focus on chocolate so something about process you're a bit of a, a sciencey minded person about the process the creation of it and it's what I, but you're interested in all the kind of fermentation profiles and all that sort of stuff that's the kind of that's what gets real chocolate nerds going isn't it um it helps the community the impact again uh, change the world through connection, community, environmental consciousness, interconnected and interest is a perfect way to demonstrate and share this. Yeah, exactly. There's very few products which connect the world in such an impactful way. When you take a bite of a chocolate bar, like I'm sitting here in Scotland and I might eat a chocolate bar that connects me with a farmer on a hillside in Peru somewhere through a chain of people that have had interactions and, and you know, that can potentially be a really positive experience for everyone involved. Um, Cool. So, yeah, well, that is, oh, that's it. I was going to say, I might just move on because uh, there's so many here, but that is the last one. So I'd like you to think, like, what if I put you on the spot there and made you think what motivates you? Try and crystallize that down if you can, because what motivates you 
can echo through into other things. Um, so one of the things that I've learned from doing campaigning is that you need to define a critical phrase. Now, one that the world uses a lot now, in a lot, especially in food and drink, is better for people, better for planet, some variation of that. Um, and it's a good phrase, right? It's alliterative, which means you know there's a sound that replicates it from the beginning of those words, better for people, better for planets. So you've got good sound kind of resonance there. Um, another one which has, for fear of giving away my politics, I think extremely unfortunately been uh, very effective is get Brexit done. So here in the UK, a general election, one of the, the recent general election was won by the now sort of prime minister um, uh, on the promise of getting Brexit done. Um, now, a lot of people would argue that that's, that there's, not, there's nothing to be proud of, but there's a really important lesson in that phrasing. Get Brexit done is a nice, short and sweet phrase. It can be turned, you know, it, it can be visualized really interestingly. It's three short words. You can put them on top of each other. You can put them next to each other. Um, you can highlight the key word in there. It's actionable, doing something. Um, I would argue it's not very good because it doesn't alliterate. Um, and I think there's something magical about alliterating. Um, I'd run a campaign uh, where we used the, 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 the tagline, uh, shake up Shire Hall. It was a kind of local election campaign. Um, and I would argue the sh sound is maybe not the most attractive sound, but shake up Shire Hall was a phrase that worked really well with people. And when we knocked on people's doors, people were repeating that phrase back to us before we'd had a chance to directly interact with them. So it was, it was sticking. Um, so get Brexit done. Perhaps in America, make America great again is one of those. It's in the same sort of vein. Um, whatever your politics, can't argue that that has had, that has had a resonance with a lot of people. Um, so there's something about distilling down things to a critical phrase, ideally three words, but I'll ask you that in a minute. Um, and using all those things that I made you think about just now, think about what are the key things that jumped out at you? What were the key words that you put in there that, 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 are, that you could turn into a critical phrase? Once you've got your critical phrase, you can cascade it in loads of different ways. So you can have your three word slogan thing that you stick on the front of your packaging, that you put on a poster, that you have as the kind of sign off when you're doing a podcast or whatever. But then each of those, the messages that are embedded in it can be exploded out and be turned into different forms of media. And all of this works better when there's an emotional resonance to it. When you can talk about things that are emotional for you or connected to some aspect of your humanness, um, it will be more effective. That's why I asked what motivates you when you talk about it. So even if what it motivates you is the nerdy sciencey thing about process and chocolate making and that sort of stuff and roasting temperatures or whatever thing it is, or um, it's, it's you being interested in it that's, that's really compelling for people, much more than just the, the actual science of it itself. Um, so I'd like you now to try and take what we talked about when you kind of had, uh, put you on the spot and said, what motivates you? Can you take what you were thinking about then and boil it down into three words? What are the three words that sum you up or perhaps your brand, if you want to think more broadly about it, that you could then use as your kind of critical phrase or you create a critical phrase from? If you can get those three words, then um, that's, a, that's a really great starting point. There's a bit of a, a challenge, this one, isn't it? Conscious chocolate now, I like that. It's actionable, it's making a demand, you know, uh, it's, it's got, you've got some, it's, it's not alliterative because the sound isn't quite the same, but you've got two C's in there, so that's good. Pioneering craft chocolate technology. Pioneering is a good emotive term, right? Um, so you could say pioneering over inventing or creating or producing even, you know, pioneering has a romance to it that's interesting. Change your chocolate. I like that because it's got that alliterative ch and ch sound. Change your chocolate. I'm sure there's someone else that's got chocolate for change. I think that exists somewhere in the world. So if you want to use change for change with chocolate, you're going to have to go, go and go ahead to them. Healing, plant power, connection. I like that. So again, think about the order as well. You know, it's, it's, so healing is the thing that appeals to you. That's your most important thing. Connection is really interesting. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I'm not testing if you can, there's no right or wrong answers here. It's going to be what's right for you, right? But there's a, it's an important exercise to try and think about these things. Um, because once you've got your three words, you can start crafting messages 
that embed those that they you know i'm not suggesting that you're going to figure those out today but once you've got them once you've got those three words you can start exploring where they fit spark your taste buds i like that that sounds a bit dangerous as well doesn't it? a bit edgy uh i don't know but yeah but like again there's you're you're connecting with that flavor thing as well that people that motivates people really effectively um, so I'm conscious of time. So I've got a couple more bits I want to go through. So I'll let you and I'll let you to ruminate on those on those points. But the point is that once you've got these talking points, these key messages, key points, um, you can start thinking about how you break them down or explode them out or, or whatever. And there's lots of different ways that you can do that. So if you've got a really core message that's really clear, you can then uh, turn it into lots of different formats. And there's no end of different ways to communicate messages in the modern world. And there's a really engaged community of chocolate-minded people and people that eat food and people that care about the environment. And there's lots of different ways to reach people. And you might have that magic trick. There might be someone here today who's got the magic trick that we all wish we could do that just ignites people's interest and, and causes a revolution in chocolate. Um, but if we think about sustainability, let's imagine that some aspect of sustainability is what we want to communicate about. You might have your catchy phrase that goes on your packaging that says whatever, uh, or safeguarding cacao flavors in the chat. Is a, that's, a, that's a good one. Safeguarding implies that you can, I can almost imagine that the logo would be a shield or something. Um, but yeah, so you can have that, that key phrase. You can have a whole blog post on your website that explains uh, what it is that you're doing the relationship that you as a chocolate maker have with cocoa farmers or that you as a cocoa farmer have how are you managing your land what have you done this week with you know whatever inputs that you're bringing into your farm that are having a positive impact or um and you might do that as a vlog on on youtube or you know if, if you, know, you might get an ai to read out your script and turn it into a video that's animated or or perhaps you break it down into a series of little segments little tiktok videos or YouTube reels, or no, it's not Instagram reels, YouTube shorts, little micro pieces. That's just your face with a 30 second communication about so a very specific thing you're doing. Maybe you want to visualize it. You create an infographic that has your three words on it with a, a nice picture. Or maybe you explode it out into a series of infographics that explain, here's the, the problem with uh, the environmental impact for cocoa. Here's what we're doing to solve it. And here's the impact that we're going to see in the future. No. And it's, it's the same message being delivered in loads of different ways. It's going to reach people's different learning styles. It's going to connect with different audiences. And somewhere in the midst of that, it's going to work. Um, and I'd like to talk specifically about storytelling as well, because I'm increasingly convinced that this is one of the most important things we can do. So people really respond to a narrative. They like to listen to a story. And when people are being delivered information, you've only got really about 20 minutes of uh, of attention span. Um, you know, people sitting in a classroom, uh, people in a lecture theater, people on a Zoom call uh, listening to someone waffle on about communicating about chocolate. Really, you've only got about 20 minutes to before people just tune out and they stop listening. Um, and that's kind of hardwired into, uh, into our brain chemistry, really. Um, but we can obviously sit through a, a three hour epic piece of cinema, right? Or we can sit and read a book for hours on end. And the reason for that is that narrative and the way information is connected together uh, aligns in our brain and means that we can be much more receptive and learn and connect and understand things better. So always think about what's the narrative. And this is a big thing for if you're doing tastings or you're interacting with customers in some way that's like that. Um, think about that you're telling a story. You're not just delivering information. Um, uh, you have a starting point. Uh, you go uh, through a journey that has specific kind of points that link to each other. Um, and, you know, perhaps there's some sort of threat or challenge. So if you're, if you're doing a tasting, you might introduce the, uh, you know, why you as a small business maker, as a craft maker or, or something are at risk of these, the big bullies and big chocolate causing trouble. Um, polluting people's bodies with poor quality chocolate, whatever it might be. Um, and then the resolution, whether that's a happy ending because you're doing great and you've given them a fantastic experience, or maybe it's a promise of some great future, you know, when, when craft chocolate takes off or whatever type of chocolate takes off. Um, but people respond to a narrative. And I, see, I think one of the worst things that people can do 
in a chocolate tasting specifically is deliver a chocolate tasting just in order of cocoa percentage, which I know for a lot of people is just the way that you do it, right? People either start from the milkiest, sweetest, lightest chocolate and they get darker and darker until they get to 100% or they do it the other way around. They start to 100% and then you come down from that. And I, my experience is that people just, they don't, they, you can't keep them going long enough uh, with that. Unless you can deliver all of that in 20 minutes, which I, I, I can't imagine you could um, if, you were, if you had any sort of range of chocolate that you're tasting. Do it and connect things thematically. So what we do at Coca Runners is we have a structure that looks at sort of different subject areas. So we we talk about the geography of different cocoa origins simultaneously with think, getting people thinking about flavor. So you're exploring how cocoa is different in different parts of the world using different processes while you know while tasting it and experiencing that through taste. We then go on a journey through history and we use different bars that are sort of representative of different points in chocolate's history of development up until today. Then there's the drama of, uh, of there's child labor, there's environmental impact, there's deforestation, there's potential slavery, all these horrible things are baked into big chocolate, big chocolate, the bad guys. What are we gonna do about it? We're gonna explore the amazing flavor of chocolate. We're gonna embrace the fact that, you know, if you pay more for a chocolate bar, you're valuing cocoa more, it's having a positive impact through the supply chain, all these sorts of things. And that's kind of our resolution. So think in terms of story, think in terms of how you communicate these things and tell your story. What are your characters? You are a character in your own chocolate making, in your story, in your virtual tasting. The cocoa itself is characterful. I don't need to tell all of you that, right? That there's different characters, flavor profiles, these sorts of things. What's the setting? If you are a cocoa farmer and you're trying to connect with consumers, people want to buy your cocoa, you've, you've got it there for you. You should have amazing, photographs of you in your environment, beautiful trees, beautiful landscapes, whatever it might be. Um, and think about what your voice is. When you're telling a story, it's, it's you telling it. And it's not you trying to use language that's not appropriate for you. Um, I think people who are really critical about how grammar is used and things like that, it's really counterintuitive. Um, I think when you write, you should write how you talk. Um, you should create social media posts that in your own voice. You should um, produce videos where you're talking naturally and not reading from a script. All these sorts of things, have they have resonance with people and they connect with people. Um, and so that kind of brings me to the end of all the things I wanted to say, really. So the kind of, I've got a couple of case studies that I've, I, can, I can show you that I think are good examples of things. But the kind of the summary point is that get people tasting your chocolate or your, whatever your product is. Um, so if you're a cocoa farmer, you, know, you, are, you are getting people to taste the beans and experience that. I know that's that's sometimes a bit of a challenge when you know they're sitting in a pod on a tree or whatever. But um, the end product is a you know you can, in some way you can get people tasting, and if you can get the consumers doing that, then that's really good because that's the main way that people will will buy into and and want to experience more of what you're offering. Tell your story, story of your beans, a story of your craft. Make yourself a character in it, um, and make everything a narrative. And think about what you want people to learn and know, and think carefully about how you're going to get there. Um, don't feel that just if you deliver information to people, it will just work. Um, unfortunately, people are, are quite annoying and quite complicated. Um, and that there are there are all these sorts of tricks that we need to use and, and get really clever with how we talk to people. Um, and just handing people a wall of text is not is not gonna is not gonna ignite people's enthusiasm for your craft. Um, so yeah, those are kind of the key points I wanted to make. I hope you don't mind uh, in, indulging me in, in letting me uh, share all that with you. Um, but I, I, you know, it's it's informal the background that, that has generated all these learnings. But I'm really confident that we've learned a lot at Coca Runners and, and me personally in the things that I've done. Um, that there's there's real value to some of these things. And even if you just go away and reflect on it and and come up with your own conclusions and own way of approaching things, I think that would be really positive. So in these last couple of minutes, I just want to kind of point to a couple of good case studies, I think personally make some interesting points. Um, and I've cited this one before, but you might be familiar with Original Beans as a Zungwa bar from Tanzania. Um, someone was from Tanzania, I think. Whether someone, I can't remember if someone said they were from Tanzania today. Who knows, maybe you are the farmer that produced this. Um, now, I think this is a really good example of them 
of original beans as a brand bringing loads of things together. Now the story of the Udzungwa bar is really connected together. So they take a story about landscape in Tanzania and the Udzungwa mountains. They take a story about human animal interactions. They tell the story of the elephants that are being affected by people encroaching into their natural space. But then they talk about the impact that those animals have on communities and how you know, the funds generated from sustainable cocoa farming allow you know, pra conservation practices that keep elephants out of farmland and in a really positive way. It's very connected to that place. You know, you feel you're transported to a actual place in the real world and you can kind of imagine it um, because the stories are there. I think a bar that has nibs is very good at doing that as well. If you want to create a connection and a sense of place in a consumer, Cacao nibs are a good way to do that because it makes cocoa less abstract. It makes it tangible that it's a physical thing. It's a plant material that was growing in a place in the real world. Um, and they communicate all of this in loads of different ways. It's on the packaging. There are images, there's text, um, there's a QR code on the packaging that takes you to a website that has a blog post explaining all of it, but also a series of videos that take you and show you uh, either with or without audio, what is happening, what is happening in our environment. And at the same time, you can experience all of that while you're tasting the chocolate, experiencing its great flavors. So I think it's a really good example of tying all of these different things together into a single product and a single experience. Um, and I'd like to highlight uh, Askinosi's chocolate as well. And I know there's some controversy about this in the chocolate space, about whether to put faces on chocolate. Now, I don't mean to necessarily Pick. You know, I don't know. I'm not going to judge whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing. I understand why people have issues with this, especially when the maker is not at origin. Um, personally, I think it's quite a positive thing to do to connect chocolate consumers with the cocoa farmers who are literally the other end of the value chain from them. And it closes that loop a little bit um, because I think for a lot of us, I'm sure we'd agree that that's the most impactful thing is that, you know, creating that equality of relationships all across the supply chain and not making it that it's just just makers and their consumers and you know cocoa is extracted as a raw material from somewhere you know that's that's how big chocolate works that's how mars bars are made or whatever so we don't we don't we're not interested in that right um, and i think having faces and telling the stories and putting names to people is a good way to do that um, again you're entitled to whatever your take on that is um, and another thing I'd just like to highlight is the work done by Catherine Laverack at Coco Encounters. There, uh, Catherine's another UK-based uh, chocolate tasting, uh, chocolate educator, I think is how she would describe herself. Um, but I'd highlight her work in, in doing kind of conceptual pairings of things. So she does a lot of work uh, linking books and chocolate together. And she does a really great, perhaps the best I've ever seen, way of talking about flavor experiences in a really emotional and conceptual way. Um, she created a selection of bars for a book that came out last year called The Secret Life of Albert and we saw which I haven't read so I can't tell you if it's good or bad but she used the themes of the book and the kind of stories being told in the book and the characters in the book to link to chocolate that makes you think more about about what you're experiencing. Um, and I'm definitely not doing it justice, but I would encourage you to go and look at the type of things that she's doing to kind of push the envelope about how you can talk to people about chocolate. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of uh, the end of what I wanted to talk about, really. So I hope you found something useful. Uh, you're quite welcome to have found absolutely nothing useful at all. And you have just been sat there waiting for me to be quiet. Um, absolutely no problem at all. Um, but if you have any thoughts or questions, so whether you want to ask me something specific um, or you have thoughts you want to share, things you disagree with, things you agree with, be even more welcome. But um, anything, I'm happy. I'm happy to, to talk about whatever you want. Um, oh, OK. So I'm being asked by Mrs. Valley. So uh, it's Coco Encounters. And the lady's name is Catherine Labrack. Um, and she's got a whole series of books um, that she's done pairings for. Um, the, that one specifically um, was called The Secret Life of Albert. And 
I just need to spell Entwistle now. Uh, Super Life of Albert Entwistle by Matt Kenny. Um, and yeah, and I would have a good look at what she's done with that, taking quite abstract ideas um, and finding a way to talk about chocolate using them. Um, and it's really, it's quite compelling. But, uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, I hope we've learned something. I suppose I have to plug Coca Runners as well because that would be that's kind of half my job, isn't it? But yeah, if you're in the UK, Coca Runners is perhaps the leading. It is the leading uh, distribution space for craft chocolate. So we're a shop. We sell craft chocolate from all over the world online. Uh, we're also a subscription service. We have a monthly box that sells uh, that gives people the opportunity to explore and discover craft chocolate, different origins, different recipes, things like that. And then we do all our outreach and advocacy um, through tastings, uh, uh, different experience events, um, all that sort of stuff as well. And as much as we can uh, do. How do you engage kids in chocolate is a great question. Uh, because, and I'm, I'm specifically extremely interested in this because um, it depends how you define kids, I suppose, because there's you know, different age groups will react very differently to things. Um, just a couple of months ago, before the summer holidays here in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, summer holidays um, recently, um, I did a series of chocolate tasting sessions with my, the local primary school in my town here. Um, and they were, they were quite young. I would say perhaps too young. Um, how old would they have been? Uh, probably eight, nine, 10 maybe 11 years old in, 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 the, in one of the oldest groups. Um, and the, they didn't really understand that there was a distinction between uh, certain types of chocolate, like chocolate is chocolate, as far as they're concerned. What was really compelling for young, very young children is uh, seeing a cocoa pod. I took an actual cocoa pod that we cracked open there and they could poke all the slimy pulp and fiddle about with it. Um, they had not a single one of them had any concept that chocolate came from a fruit item, so that, that it was a pod, uh, that, that, that there's a whole series of processes. They'd literally never given it a moment's thought that chocolate comes from anything other than a supermarket shelf. So that was really impactful, having a thing that they could touch and hold and look at um, while they were tasting, um, I guess how to engage them um, is hard. Outside of a classroom experience, I don't know. Um, when they get older, kids that are around, 13, 14, uh, are starting to ask very well considered serious questions about environmental impact. And young people care way more about that than, uh, than almost any other demographic. Um, so that could be a way to reach them and engage them. Um, but I haven't had a great deal of experience in doing that. Um, the way I've been doing it so far, we've tried a virtual tasting series of lessons um, where I essentially mirrored subject areas in school so I try I took um, history geography and science and turned those into three lessons about chocolate with the focus being on those subject areas um, the recording is going again but I'm probably not going to say anything much more insightful so um, Daniel saying uh, Mrs. Vale saying how do you motivate customers to respond to polls and surveys um, yeah that's a hard one as well right so um, Traditionally, you offer them some sort of carrot. Um, so if you want people to do any sort of in-depth, meaningful responses for you, you have to give them a reward for their time for doing it. So if you want to do a big like customer survey, you give them a 10% discount if they can make it to the end or something like that. You know, uh, Some sort of benefit for having sat through and clicked through a bunch of questions and given you feedback and ratings and stuff. Um, uh, other than that, it's really quite hard because you, you'll inevitably get a bias where people, only the people that either love you or hate you will give you a, a, a kind of significant response. But the, the important ones are all the ones in the middle that you can kind of, you can sway and change their minds and, and, and learn more about. Um, so yeah, um, so something that we're working on at Coca Runners is we're going to do a big kind of customer market survey type thing over the next few months. Um, and the way we're going to approach it probably is to break it down into lots of different modules, talk to different groups of people about different topics um, on different platforms and try and bring it all together at the end. If that's been helpful. 
Um, Daniel saying thank you on the spy blue presentation of good points. Oh no, thank you so much. No, honestly, that's yeah, it's my pleasure. If it's been if it's been helpful to a couple of people, then, then I'm, I'm, that's fantastic.